welcome. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Alan Ecker. Thank you very much, and it's uh, really a privilege to be here with this group and uh, friends, uh, colleagues, students. When I looked at my uh, topic that I had when I said uh, business lessons from my six careers, I thought maybe I better give a subtopic because you might have thought I can't keep a job if I was six different careers. And my subtopic really is uh, that I found there's a link between lessons learned uh, and good leadership to produce uh, success in business. So really I'll be talking about the lessons I've learned, but how they link to leadership skills that will make a business a success. And I think a successful career is dependent on learning the good use of leadership skills so that you can take advantage of opportunities when they occur. There's no substitute, I think, for experience, both working for a really good leader and being a good leader yourself. You'll find there'll be some good times and some bad times, but you'll learn from both of them. I found that most of the critical success factors in leadership will apply to any business, whether it's a technology business, whether it's a retail business, or really what is the market. So I believe that whatever career you pursue, pursue, the result is going to be dependent on how you respond to competitive opportunities. And these are the competitive opportunities that you will experience throughout your career. It may not be totally politically correct to uh, say competitive opportunities, but I think that uh, the world's built as a a competitive place. Uh, you had to have a competitive opportunity as a student to get into Georgia Tech. I know that there were about 28,000 almost applicants this year, but I think only about 2,500 of them uh, or more uh, just that actually are enrolled. So uh, that's a competitive thing. It's, if you're a varsity athlete, it's a competitive thing to make the varsity in, in athletics. If you're going for a job, it's competitive to get the job, and on and on. So uh, most of the time in my life, the uh, competitive opportunities that I encountered weren't something that I planned in some long-range plan. I think that's another uh, sort of truism that uh, what you've got to do is be on the lookout for the opportunities and be ready to take advantage of them. But uh, when you graduate from high school, I don't think you can say now for the next 20 years, here's my plan and here are the opportunities I'm going to see. I used to say I had four careers and now I find it's six. My first career was football. I came to Georgia Tech, as I said, to uh, play football. I didn't come to be an engineer. Matter of fact, I'm a little bit of a black sheep in my family uh, being an engineer. My dad was a college professor and uh, uh, my grandfather, one side, was a medical doctor, on the other side, a Presbyterian minister. My uncles on my mother's side were all doctors, so here I am coming in and being an engineer. But so I came to play football, play football for Coach Bobby Dodd, and um, I think that was a really good choice. <laughs> my second career was in the Air Force as an Air Force officer, and the third career really was just uh, here at Georgia Tech. Uh, after the Air Force, I worked with Engineering Experiment Station, which was the predecessor to GTRI, and was, worked up to be a lab director there. <clears throat> then the fourth and fifth careers are really the ones of over 30 years where I was in the telecom industry, high tech, with an East Coast medium-sized company like Scientific Atlanta, and a very large West Coast company like Cisco Systems. Different cultures, different approaches, uh, and my friend Bertrand Cooper, who was with me and uh, for many years at Scientific Atlanta, will say they were totally different cultures, I believe. Right, Bertrand? <laughs> Before I um, go on and uh, uh, a little bit more in each one of these careers, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about um, uh, the telecom industry in which 
uh, Scientific Atlanta grew and which I was an executive in for about 35 years. We provided products and systems and solutions to the big telecom companies like AT&T and Verizon, Time Warner, Cox, Comcast, Cablevision, in Canada, Videotron and Rogers, even sometimes in the UK with Virgin. Uh, and so all of these telecom companies, which are sometimes called service providers because what they do is they're providing services to consumers, they uh, eventually went into what was called the the bundle, giving you television service, high-speed data service, and voice service. It started out with TV, but then grew uh, uh, to be the, 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 the triple bundle, and that's what really grew the business. Now, uh, Scientific Atlanta is uh, part of Cisco Systems, and it's still doing the same uh, product lines, but they're adding to it now because um, what they're looking at is other applications, other ways of getting additionally revenue from subscribers. You, you, you pay a subscription fee every month and uh, you get your television, you can get on-demand services, you can get your high-speed data, you can get your voice all together, but they're looking for other things like security and and other applications that they can do as well. Does anybody know how Scientific Atlanta got started? I, I know you gave a little bit of a summary of Scientific Atlanta. Anybody know here? Uh, Stephen, you really know? <laughs> uh, seven tech grads, a hundred bucks a piece, right? Well, it was five tech grads, but a uh, hundred bucks a piece in 1951, but they had one more guy. <laughs> they invited uh, Glenn Robinson, who was up working at uh, Oak Ridge as a physicist for the government, in the nuclear program, and they said, if you'll put another $100 in, we'll let you be CEO. <laughs> and, and, and that's the way uh, Scientific Atlanta got started. And of course, it began with, as an instrument company. The first product for Scientific Atlanta was actually designed in the predecessor of GTRI. It was a pattern recorder for antenna patterns, and uh, that was the first commercial product for Scientific Atlanta. But then it moved into the satellite communications area and then into cable television. And of course, cable started with just a few analog channels. It was primarily a way of getting television if you didn't live in the metropolitan area where you could get off air. So they put up really big towers and put an antenna on top of it and put cable out to their friends and neighbors so that you could get the off air programming for the, just the regular channels. But in the 1970s, there was a start where Sid Topol, who was chairman and CEO of Scientific Atlanta, and Andy Inglis was uh, the CEO of RCA Americom that makes communication satellites, and Jerry Levin was the CEO of Home, of home Box Office, HBO, and uh, they got together and said, look, uh, this is pretty stupid what we're doing right now. They were bicycling VHS tapes around with the movies of uh, home bo box office, HBO. And sometimes they'd get lost in the mail, sometimes they wouldn't get there on schedule. And so we said, let's do a satellite cable connection. And so we said, Scientific Atlanta, we'll put an earth station to receive the satellite signal at every cable head in. HBO said, we'll provide the programming. And RCA said, we'll put the satellite up for it. And that was the satellite cable connection that started with, with then getting programming that you couldn't get off air in, in the city. And then others followed with uh, uh, Disney, ESPN, Showtime, uh, did the same sort of thing. They would put their signals up and then that was what caused the growth of the cable industry. I gotta tell you a couple other little stories of, of this time. Um, in the mid 70s, uh, Ted Turner came to us and said, uh, I bought this little UHF television station in Atlanta called Channel 17. And what I want to do is I want to have a super station. I want you to make me a satellite uplink because it just, FCC had just allowed private companies to have uplinks and you didn't have to be a common carrier. And then I'm going to send it out to all these uh, cable head ends that you guys have done for uh, HBO and that'll be a super station. 
We say, okay, Ted, we've been most of our work, and Steve, you can appreciate this, and Bob can too. We've been with DOD, and so we had, so we'll get our engineers with your engineers. We'll we'll go up all the specs. We'll put together a contract and and, and do the the details of this. And he said, No, you make it. It works. Or I'll kill you. <laughs> and he said, Here's a down payment check. Don't cash it till next week. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, he then came to us later in the early 1980s and said, I got this other idea. I bought this little progressive club over on 10th Street which is um, just by the connector. And what I want to do is I want to have a satellite dish pointed at every satellite in the sky so that I can get news from anywhere in the world, anytime. And what we'll do is we'll have a 24-hour news station. We said, well, Ted, I, th I think everybody watches news at 6 and 11. They watch Walter Cronkite and the Huntley Brinkley and whoever else. Uh, you think people are really going to watch 24-hour news? Yeah, we're going to do it. We said, well, hey, if you want to do it and you want to pay for it, that's great. So if you go to the GCAT building and you look out the garage, you'll see all of those uh, many antennas there. But that was CNN. And uh, so I, I guess one lesson you could say from this is, initially, innovation can trump everything. And uh, it certainly did, because that <clears throat> is what made the cable industry. Because if you look at Scientific Atlantic, when I joined the company, the annual sales were $40 million dollars when we were acquired by Scientific Atlanta, was acquired by Cisco, the annual sales were $3.1 billion, and they paid $6.9 billion for Scientific Atlanta. So it was a pretty good run. Right, Virgil? <laughs> so today you've got hundreds of channels. You've got on-demand TV. By the way, we got some engineering Emmys for inventing on the video on-demand. Uh, uh, DVRs, we were the first cable guy to have a hard drive in a box with DVRs, interactive program guides, then multi-megabit high-speed data, voice over internet protocol, V over IP, and then many of the services over fiber optics, and even all the way fiber optics to the home, as Verizon does. And this is really a dramatic uh, a change in technology, so it looks so good that the uh, at that time, that's when AT&T and Verizon got in the business because they thought here is a, another market that they could come and take. So maybe that's another lesson. Competition catches up with you and can pass you if you don't keep innovating. Uh, I have to tell you, I was giving a presentation to the Scientific Atlanta board about our R&D program, and, and uh, one of the uh, directors said, and I won't say who, said, well, you keep doing this R&D. When are you going to finish the R&D? And I said, I, I, either unfortunately or fortunately, I don't think we'll ever finish the R&D as long as we're in business. Now, the, the solution that they're providing now, and what I think this was a Time Warner name originally, is the four innies. Any content, anywhere, to any device, any time. The four innies. So you have a gateway, really, to the home, and you can put it on your PC, your TV, your smartphone, your laptop. Uh, PlayStation, you name it, but any content, anywhere, anytime, to any device. And I tell you, this has gotten so complicated now when you've got all of these other things with Google and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. I, I said that for a guy like me who, when I played in tech, uh, it was black and white television until our junior year. Wade and I played in the first game that was color television over national TV. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's a while back. It was Miami, if you don't remember, Wade, <laughs> University. But uh, I said, uh, uh, they're doing kidney transplants. They're doing liver transplants, heart transplants. I'm going to go out to Emory Medical School and see if I can get a brain transplant so I can keep up with all of this that's going on. And so I went out, and they said, yeah. Uh, Matter of fact, you can. You know, now we sell it by the pound. I said, you sell it by the pound? Well, show me. So, well, here's uh, Clemson grad. It's $100 a pound. Here's Georgia Tech grad. That's $500 a pound. And here's University of Georgia grad. It's $2,500 a pound. I said, I can surely see why Tech is, uh, you know, five times Clemson. But Georgia, why? I said, well, it's almost like new. It's hardly ever been used. <laughs> and do you know how many Georgia grads it takes to make a pound of brain? <laughs> Don, I have my obligatory. The, Don Chapman is here, and I don't know if you know it's a tradition. 
at the Foundation Board of Trustees, to start every meeting, Don gives his uh, UGA joke. Uh, his often, though, have uh, co-eds in them, but <laughs> at least I didn't have a co-ed in this one. <laughs> I've looked, worked for uh, leaders and bosses of, of, of various types. I've worked for uh, head coaches. I've, I've worked for uh, Air Force officers, academic staff, CEOs, and chairmen. And I've been a leader in many of those same roles as a uh, officer and a lab director in, in business going up from VP of R&D to CTO to sector president and then executive vice president for the company and even executive consultant for Cisco. And um, I had a very wise person tell me in my Air Force career many years ago that you never go to work for an organization or a company. You always are working for another person. And I found that really to be true in my six careers. And think about it a little bit in your careers and in other times that, that you're really not working for a company. Oh, the company is important and the organization is important, but you personally are always working for another person. And so what does that mean? Well, I'll give you a few things that I think it means. You need to be really careful in selecting your boss. I <laughs> think you've got to have a good relationship with your boss. And... Uh, that boss needs to be a good mentor for you and a good role model for you. So uh, a principle of this or a lesson is select your boss wisely. I think you're in a no-win situation if you, uh, if you don't have that kind of relationship with your boss. Another one is help your boss so that the, your boss looks good. Uh, your boss will get promoted and then that will leave a place for you to move up. And so that's an important thing to help your boss. Get, and smart bosses take those you know, sharp performers up the ladder with them. Then another one that I learned in the Air Force was train your people so that you have somebody who can take your job. You don't want to uh, be in a position so that the people looking to this say, well, we can't promote this person because there's nobody to take his place. And so you want to have trained somebody to take your place. And then, uh, however, just one final thing here in the lesson. Don't be so on, intent on being promoted that you forget to uh, really do an outstanding performance in, in your present job. Uh, just some specific things I've learned from my bosses, my different ones, and the first one was uh, Coach Dodd. And I'll have to have, uh, be very honest here with Wade sitting in, Wade Mitchell sitting in the audience because Wade was uh, the quarterback when I was a, a pulling guard and inside linebacker and nose guard, all, all of those together. Uh, I had the privilege, really, for playing for Coach Dodd, and uh, you can realize now why the stadium's named for him and why uh, the, uh, there's an annual College Coach of the Year award for Coach Dodd. I had great coaches. Uh, Ray Graves was our defensive coordinator, and Frank Bowles was our offensive coordinator, and you may have heard from about some of those. Uh, uh, Frank Bowles went on to Arkansas, and Ray Graves went on to Florida and did very well there. And so I had great coaches and great teammates, and that gave me competitive opportunities to excel. And uh, again, that's uh, pick your boss and your teammates carefully. <laughs> when I was at Tech, uh, we were fortunate to, uh, as I say, have great coaches and great teammates. And so we were nationally ranked when I was there. We won major bowl games every year and uh, there weren't that many at that time. It was, you know, it was the Rose Bowl, Cotton Bowl, Sugar Bowl, Orange Bowl, and Gator Bowl, and that was about it. And then maybe the Liberty Bowl came in after that. So when you went to a bowl game, that was, that was a very significant thing. And we went to uh, the Sugar Bowl, to the Cotton Bowl, and to the Gator Bowl. And, uh, and so that was uh, the, the, the top bowl at that time. So what, what is, uh, oh, I guess I should say this to her because I've already said it. Uh, we also beat Georgia every year when I was here. <laughs> Including 35 to nothing between the hedges my senior year <laughs> over in Athens. Uh, one, one of the things you learn, and I, I think it's clear that when you've got these 
uh, top Division One teams competing. You've got talented athletes. You've got good coaches. They've got good offensive systems and defensive systems, good scouting. And so what's going to be the difference between winning and losing? Well, here's the lesson that I learned and think is really important to carry in every career I've had is um, give your best effort on every play, even all the way into the fourth quarter. And then the second is uh, you've got to have confidence in yourself, your coaches, and your teammates. So how do you do that? Well, here's what Coach Dodd, and I remember him saying this, you never know which one of the plays is going to be the big play until it's over. So you've got to give 100% on the play every time because you want to make sure that you aren't the guy that misses the tackle or misses the block. And that goes all the way into the fourth quarter when you're tired. you still got to give 100% on every play because you know which one's going to decide the game. And that applies in business, too, because I think business is a competition. And then confidence. You can't fake confidence. It's not some sort of external rah-rah that you get a pep talk. You, you, and the big problem is if you're not confident, you play tentatively. You're that half a step behind, or you're wondering exactly what to do while the guy passes you. You've got to be confident so that you know exactly what to do at what time. So what Coach Dodd said, that confidence comes from being prepared, being prepared mentally and physically. So that's, again, a big lesson in business. The being prepared is a, a critical element of success. We had, uh, one of the reasons you went to Tech and with Coach Dodd is he had the reputation that he was sort of like a NFL coach. After the start of the season, you didn't scrimmage and knock yourself out where other places uh, could have gone at Auburn, or Alabama, or Georgia, Florida, even Vanderbilt. It, it looked like sometimes what they did is they had wars among themselves during the week and whoever survived got to play on Saturday. And, uh, and that, so I thought with Coach Dodd's approach, I, I liked it a little better. <laughs> we even got accused of just playing volleyball uh, over the goalpost sometimes and not really being tough, but he was really in on conditioning and reaction drills. Be quick, be fast, be able to react, and be in shape so that you win in the fourth quarter. And then he was uh, very much on uh, uh, the being prepared with the scouting reports. He gave us written exams that we had to make 100 on, on what to expect and who was going to block us and what they did on every play. He'd get us an oral exams, and we we'll remember this on the day before the game out on Grant Field, and he'd go on and say, okay, Eckers on the 30-yard line, and it's uh, uh, third and eight. What do you expect? I'm on defense. Okay, I've got to know that it's a screen to the right, number one, a trap to the left, and uh, you know, off tackle. Those are the three tendencies. And who's going to block you on that play? Who's going to try to block you on that play? You had to know all that. And believe me, you didn't want to be embarrassed and, and have not written, be able to memorize the scouting report. So that, but again, that's being prepared to know what you, what you uh, were going to expect. And uh, he also had another thing. He, he, he told us that because we went to Georgia Tech, we were smarter than the other guys on the other team. And, and he, I don't know if you had ever heard him talk, but he had a little bit of an East Tennessee twang. And it never was Georgia Tech. It was Georgie Tech. You, you're, you're, you're smarter than they are. You're from Georgie Tech. And he had us convinced of that. And I think that was another thing for our, for our confidence. So um, that was football. And uh, we can have some further questions about it and some other events. And Wade well, can help me answer them later. Second career in the Air Force. And just two things I want to highlight there um, is re really the role model of, of senior officers and uh, for leadership and a balance between command, responsibility, and humility. That's, I guess, the, the lesson I learned. And I'll, I'll tell one on myself. When, when I reported to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the largest Air Force Base in the world, and certainly in the US Air Force, and uh, I was a second lieutenant. And uh, of course, there were generals and colonels and all there. And, and if you were a major, you, it, that was pretty good. But I mean, that, the, you weren't senior officers. There were all sorts of the, the senior officers. 
So they were role models. And um, I just got married. We were in married officers' quarters. And one of the things there, they, you had to take care of the lawn yourself. And you had to go over to the base to the, where the equipment was and from the enlisted and check out a lawn mower and come back and then mow your grass. And I lived next door to a major who was a West Point graduate, spit and polish and uh, everything, you know, uh, military. And so I, I you know, had been, you know, sort of a big man on the campus here, I have to admit, you know, everybody, when you play football, they know you. And then I was in the fraternity and so forth. And so I was now very lowly in it on the low end of the rung in, in, in the Air Force. But I uh, had, it, it rained a lot, very wet grass, and so I went over, got the lawnmower, and mowed my grass. When, when I was through, it was just covered with grass, inside out, all around. I put it in the back of the car and started out, and the major said, you're not going to take that back like that, are you? I said, well, isn't that what the enlisted men do, is, is that sort of thing? He said, what kind of role model and what sort of example are you setting for them? And so I very sheepishly got it, got the hose and cleaned it all off and took it back. But I learned a lesson that, that, that you, you've, got to, uh, you, you've got to be a role model and you can't appear that you're trying to take advantage of, to, of getting uh, somebody to do things for you that you didn't want to do yourself. And then the other one was I was working for a general and he had this big car with a star on it and had a big office at the corner of the building and had a, you know, airman that went around and got coffee for him and this sort of thing. And I said, well, doesn't it make you feel real guilty for all of this, uh, you know, when uh, he said, no, it just gives you young bucks something to look forward to. <laughs> but what he's really saying is that um, he had command responsibility. And I think what you learn there is he had some perks but he wanted to concentrate his time on the responsibility that he had. It was in the Vietnam War. I was there with the Berlin airlift. I was there with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there when we had my mates who were flying B-52 sitting in their planes 24-7 because there might be a, a, an alarm when we were on red alert. And he had to concentrate on those, and so as you go up, don't feel guilty about that. You want to concentrate on what's really important. So, uh, so much for the Air Force, but a balance of humility and command responsibility. Just two things at uh, GTRI. The first was, that's the first time I really had to make a payroll. Uh, uh, you know the way GTRI works is <clears throat> that's a different they're not tenured professors. They're research scientists and engineers. They even sign contracts. And if we don't get enough uh, research from outside contracts, you don't have a job. Right, Bob? <laughs> and so that was the first time, I mean, I'd had to make the payroll and make, make it bring in enough business to make the payroll. And that's learning a real lesson in uh, business when you've got to make the payroll and the people that work for you, uh, job is dependent on that. And that means you got to get out and it's uh, go out and get contracts. And later on, obviously, it's getting bookings when you're in uh, the private sector. And the second one is I looked up and I saw that most of the people above me were being brought in from outside. That uh, it was that time Georgia Tech was trying to, wasn't, didn't have the prestige it does right now, frankly. And <clears throat> they were trying to raise the awareness, and so they were bringing from very high-profile schools the people above, and I saw that I had, it wasn't going to be promoted straight up, and so I was in a no-win situation, and that's when I decided to go to Scientific Atlanta to go to work for my old friend Jack Kelly, who, by the way, I had worked with as a graduate research assistant while I was in graduate school at, at Tech, and he had gone on to Scientific Atlanta and worked up to be the executive vice president there. I got to tell another story now going to SA and Cisco. When I, I just had 10 years at Georgia Tech, so my retirement had vested. Now I would have gotten such a small percent of a small salary, I couldn't have lived on anything, <laughs> even if I'd retired at 65 or something. But uh, I, I, I was impressed that I did have a vested retirement there. So when Jack was interviewing me, 
I asked him, I said, well, now tell me about the retirement program here and so forth. He said, what the hell are you asking me about the retirement program? He said, you ought to be asking me, what's the stock price right now? What can we do to make the stock price go up? And how many options are you going to get? <laughs> so I, I learned, uh, I didn't know beans about business when I uh, left and went to Scientific Atlanta. Fortunately, I had some great mentors like Jack Kelly, Sid Topol, Glenn Robinson, who did, and uh, I was a very willing student. But uh, that's one of the things you know that uh, in business, the, uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask the question, what's the primary job of a CEO in a business? Anybody want to answer that you know? By the way, when I had, used to give a lecture at Blake Charrington's course, I had a 10-question uh, uh, pop quiz that I gave everybody on, on business to see if they knew how business really works. Is, anybody know what's the number one job? Yeah, what? Make money for the shareholders. Well, that's, but how does he do that? Huh? Yeah. But the one, one thing is what they call, you, you're right, shareholder value, but the way you do it, that's a euphemism for stock price. You want the stock price to be going up, and you want to have the Wall Street analyst doing a projection that you will grow sales and earnings, but earnings faster than sales, but that your stock price goes up. So the, the number one job of a CEO is to create shareholder value, which means get the stock price to go up. So uh, that's, that's one lesson you learn r right away, that you've got to report to Wall Street on a company that's on the New York Stock Exchange every quarter, you know, your bookings, your sales, your margins, your, and your, your profits, and uh, your balance sheet. And then you've got to do, you've got to beat your numbers quarter over quarter, and you've got to beat your numbers year over year. And general managers live and die by their financials. And I've seen some go and some... <laughs> stay because they either made their financials or they didn't. Uh, Sid Topol, and it, any of you know Sid? Uh, uh, probably some of you do know Sid. Uh, terrific guy, and uh, st I still talk with him every month or so. He's still living in Boston and uh, still very active, and he, he's in his sixth career too, uh, giving back and uh, and working with a number of charitable organizations. But Sid. Uh, the, the joke on Sid was every meeting you went to, whether it was with the lawyers, whether it was with HR, whether it was with marketing, whether it was sales, turned out to be a bookings meeting. And his statement everywhere was, bookings, bookings, bookings. And nothing ever starts in a company until you book the order. And uh, so that's something you really learn that uh, uh, you, if, if you're going to grow the top line and you're going to uh, create shareholder value, you've got to beat the competition and get bookings. And uh, you, the way you, you've got to find out who's the decision maker, who's your competition, uh, what's it going to take to get the order, what price, and have you got guts to take it at that price and then tell Birchall he's got to get the cost out of it because we took it at a low margin. <laughs> Birchall Cooper was with me at Scientific Atlanta heading up the engineering group. and so. One of the things you do have to do is, when it's a competitive, you have to have a plan to take the cost out because you have to sometimes go with very low prices to win competitively. And so you have to, hey, I'll get a new chip, I'll get a new design, I'll get whatever else that we could come up with manufacturing and procurement and engineering all to uh, take the cost out. But we always had plans to take the cost out every six to nine months. But that's what you got to do. Uh, but Sid always started with the bookings. He also had one other thing I wanted to say is, he's, he would say, you don't get your authority from the organization chart, you get your authority from knowledge. And so it was always the, what you know about, learn it, get the details, and know about it. Your authority comes from your knowledge, not from the org chart. Then uh, Jim McDonald was the chairman CEO when uh, we were acquired by Cisco. He would, he was also an athlete. He played uh, basketball for Adolph Rupp at Kentucky, so he got some of his uh, background, I'm sure, from athletics as well. But uh, there were sort of two things I'll say he, from him. He always would say, hire the smartest, most experienced, the best people you can possibly 
hire to work for you. Don't worry about it if they know more than you do. They should. In their area, they should, and I want them to. They're not your competitors. So you've got to make sure when your bosses don't think that they, they have to know everything you know and also make sure that they uh, uh, don't think for somehow you're in competition with them. And then the other thing that uh, I always laugh from Jim was his prime directive to all of us was, don't let me do something stupid. And that's a good thing to do to tell the people that we're, because sometimes they may have a detail of something, something, no, but don't let me do anything stupid. Then John Chambers, a terrific guy, I don't know how many of you know John, who's the chairman and CEO of Cisco, and uh, his person-to-person uh, -person contact and personal relationships. He came to Scientific Atlanta and talked to each member of the executive team personally, one-on-one. -on -one. And then when we actually had the acquisition, he came and made a presentation himself to the, all the employees. So for, for somebody for a 44 uh, you know, billion dollar a, a year company to a three million dollar a year company to take the time to come in and, and talk to the executives and talk to the employees, that always impressed me. The other thing is John told me, and I wholeheartedly agree with him, when you're in the high tech business and in the product business, you um, you have to anticipate and be willing to spend a lot of money on R&D on something that you really are going to bring in, but there is some risk to it. And you can't get a new product in two or three years. It usually takes five years to really get a new product by the time you go from the initial concept design and prototypes and testing and then get it to the marketplace. And so you've got to plan your products in a five-year cycle. We've been planning ours in about a three-year cycle. But you, you really need to look out five years. And he had something. I didn't like his acronym, but he got all of the leadership team together once a year for, and we'd go through the different strategies in, in each one of the businesses. It was called the Strategic Leadership Offsite, the SLOW. I thought that's sort of a bad name for it, but that, that, I think he didn't realize what the acronym would be when, when he did. I think the idea of strategic leadership offsite is great. I just, it was funny, we always called it the slow, but that was getting the, uh, the, the five year plan. So to close here, uh, just to um, give you some closing advice from me uh, in my six careers and uh, going from uh, black and white TV to uh, what we have today, I want to remind you that you need to find and mine your competitive opportunities. That's going to be the way your career will grow. That's the way you will have success. Remind you that successful leadership is a critical part of um, having a successful career and getting the skills to do that. And I had always closed uh, uh, presentations I'd make to our new employees orientation session at Signing of Atlanta with going back to our founding fathers and the Declaration of Independence, which really is uh, one of our sources of what we do about competitive opportunities in the U.S. because it says we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't say happiness, it says the pursuit of happiness. So I said, well, how in the world do you pursue happiness? And uh, the first thing I think is you've got to be honest. If you're not honest and the people you're working for are not honest, you don't have any trust. You've got to, as a leader, have the trust of your people. And they, uh, you have to trust them and they have to trust you. And honesty is where it all starts. You've got to be assertive. And I have my own definition for assertive. I say if a person's aggressive, they want to have it a certain way because it's their way. If you're assertive, you're really trying to do what you believe is best for the organization, and you're speaking up for what's best for the organization, but it's not just because it's your thing. That's being aggressive. So be assertive. Be positive. Have you ever seen a good coach or a good leader who was negative? I mean, you don't go in and say, God, I don't believe we can win this game. Those guys are bigger than we are, and we ain't got a chance, you know. Uh, you, uh, you, you've got to be positive and uh, set that tone with, with, you, with your company and with the, your team that you're leading. Then you've got to be persistent. There are going to be times when you get knocked down. There are going to be times when it's tough. 
And I've seen so many people with talent who don't make it because they don't have persistence. You've got to be persistent. And then you've got to be yourself because you can't be anybody else and you've got your own gifts, your own talents, and you've got to find out what those are and exploit those, but you can't be somebody else. You've got to be yourself. So you've got to be honest, assertive, positive, persistent in yourself. So always remember to look out for your competitive opportunities and when you find them, bust your buns to make them your success. So that's what I had uh, somewhat as a prepared uh, few statements and they say would you like to have some Q&A here so uh, if anybody has any questions I'd be happy to address them if I can't find the answer I've got enough people on the front row to, uh, <laughs> to refer them to. Uh, Dr. Director, could I ask you what you think the direction the cable industry is going in the near future? Well, <laughs> I'm not in it right now, so I, I can give you uh, my outside look at, at where I think it's going. I, I think the, uh, the, the two big types of competitors that they've got to look out for uh, like I said, you've got to continue to innovate, and if you don't continue to innovate, you, you, you lose. Uh, the, one of them is like Netflix, wh where uh, they're going to offer and do offer services like there. In the past, the cable guys have been able to beat them because they control the network to the home. And it, it depends on regulations. It depends on what they do, uh, but they uh, need to uh, uh, look out for Netflix. The others are people who are like a Google or like Apple who want to have their gateway into the home as well. Apple's already got it in, the, in your smartphone and Google's on every device you, you've got. <laughs> but they, they still would like to maybe be the, the leader on the gateway to the home. So I, I think those are the two they've got to look out for. My personal belief is what the cable industry needs to do, and I know they're looking at this, is look for additional applications that you can put in. And I think one of the ones that is, could be the most, uh, uh, I'll say sticky, is cause them people to keep with you, uh, is healthcare. Uh, we're doing some things that mark us right now on uh, telehealth, where you can remotely diagnose and treat uh, using the two-way high-speed network. Uh, high definition uh, is an I, uh, pad to control the camera on the other end and so the clinician it cuts down the cost and it cuts down the time for clinicians so I think the places they could start are with pediatrics where people don't like to take their kids to the doctor anyway and the elderly and you, you can the, the Cisco I'll make a little plug here has uh, what they call telehealth and uh, they have a system there where you can get the vitals over, over the system, you can even have a camera and look in the eyes to see the retina, look in the ears, look in the nose. And so I think the cable industries could, if they would get the right things, uh, have something uh, in the healthcare area which is going to be critical because of we've got to do something about the cost and we've got to do something about the number of clinicians uh, declining relative to the number of people who need them. Stephen? Hey, Alan. Thanks for being here. Uh, question for you. Uh, uh, Scientific Atlanta has had an incredible run in Atlanta, created an uh, immense amount of success, products, wealth, uh, uh, and so forth. But, uh, but it got sold. And, and you look around at some of the companies you talked about. Turner got bought by Time Warner. Um, Bell South got bought by AT&T. Uh, Weather Channel Smaller got bought by NBC. Y'all got bought by Cisco. Um, so Atlanta has created these, these great companies, but they got bought. Uh, are, are we doomed to be a branch office town, or is there, is there something for us to look forward to? Well, that's a tough question, Stephen, because uh, you can imagine that, that I have uh, both business and personal uh, uh, thoughts about that. It has to do, again, with shareholder equity, uh, and when the CEO and the board uh, 
see that uh, the opportunities you have for international business have to be significantly increased because everything is going international. And when they look at the competition and look at what someone like Cisco is willing to pay, that's probably the best uh, value you can give your shareholders. So as I say, if the number one job of a CEO is shareholder value, you can't blame CEOs for getting their shareholders that value. I, I wish it could be another way. Uh, one of the problems is that things have become so complicated that uh, uh, R&D is really expensive now. And as I say, it takes five years to get a new product. You spend all that money. I, I think I had the largest overrun ever at Scientific Atlanta when we switched from analog to digital television. Uh, and, but, and we started in 1992 and didn't get my first sale until 1998. And uh, I was wondering about my job there for a while. When we, but of course, we went from 600 million to 3.1 billion, really, on the digital television and the two-way digital network. I, I think it's, you, you've got to uh, be innovators, but at the same time, you've got to figure out how to do the R&D and get the new products in. And So what do you think, in your opinion, was the most interesting product or product line that you worked on in Scientific Atlanta? The most interesting product that I worked on? Well, I, I think maybe it's, uh, there were a number of them, and maybe I'll ask Bertrand what he thinks. I think maybe it was the DVR, uh, because this was the first time you put a hard drive in a, a set, you have a, you know, a digital set top. And so, what we had to do to D do DVR, we had to put a hard drive in there. We had to have a big processor. We had to have a lot of memory. We had to have an operating system with middleware. And um, it turned out that the, you couldn't use the hard drive exactly the same way as the hard drive that was in a computer. If you realize where the computer has a fan in it, you can't use a fan in a set-top because that puts noise in the entertainment center, and you can't have a fan. So that meant it was operating about 10 degrees hotter than it would in a, uh, in a computer. And uh, when it gets that hot, the, uh, the head goes down on the, the plate and uh, bounces, and you get hits, and your reliability goes to where you have 15% returns. And I get a call from the CTO of Time Warner, uh, and I have to give him an email every day telling him what we're going to do to uh, to get the, get the reliability back. But what we, I mean, a lot of things we had to do, uh, but uh, I think that was probably the challenging, but also most rewarding, because once you did it and you've got the hard drive, there's so many more things that you can do then, because essentially you've got a computer uh, there uh, at, with your two-way high-speed digital network going to it. By, you know, by the way, we had a, a DVR in, cable box two years before anybody else. <laughs> Great. Yes, my question relates again to this comment on, on CEO's job in terms of maximizing shareholder value uh, and, and the emphasis on stock prices and what that means from an innovation standpoint. I'd really be curious as to your reaction to this, but there's a general belief that by focusing on shareholder value or stock prices that you tend to put your R&D investment into shorter term projects that are going to have more immediate payback. Yet, uh, you talked about the need in your industry to plan out at least five years in terms of your future product development. And I guess I'm asking, how do you balance that uh, where you may have a market that's expecting more immediate uh, payback versus the need to invest heavily in products that will have a very deferred, if a payback at all? How do you bring that together in terms of, of, uh, of uh, evaluating short-term project with short-term payback versus very long-term projects that, that have some risk associated with the payback? Well, I, I, you do it very carefully, but, but I, I think the thing that you have to do is you really have to have several types of R&D. You have to have some R&D that enhances your existing products and, and takes the cost out so that you can take the price down on those and still get your margins. To, and then you've got to have some long range. So, so really the balance is what you can do to enhance and improve with taking cost out because then you can make it 
cheaper to the, your customer, and things you can do with software to get new apps and new features and functions. And so you have to have some doing that, but then you've got to have some which are the long range uh, projects, which are going to be the innovation, which will be the, the real quantum jumps in your, in your business going forward. Yes, 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 definitely. I mean, they'll, they'll all be with, but you have to have some that are enhancing your, your current products and taking the cost out and uh, adding new features to your, these products. And these are the short term ones. And then you have to have some of the, if, if you're going to grow the company, what are, what are the big bets you're going to have in the future? And then you'd also try to go for uh, additional customers, you know, as, as well, if you can get. The question: yeah. uh, How did you adjust to the various different organizational cultures when you change jobs throughout your career? How did I adjust to what? The different organizational cultures, from like the <laughs> Air Force okay. to scientific. The different Atlanta. organizational cultures. Well, um, as I, I told you a little bit of how I adjusted, a major gave me a, a, a very nice uh, uh, lesson in, in in the Air Force, and then. Uh, there, there are other things that you learn when you report to active duty, and uh, uh, of uh, you, you know, you 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 do not ever violate your security clearance. You do not ever have a, a check that bounces, and you don't have an affair with a base commander's wife. <laughs> those those were the three things. Those were the three things they told me when I reported to duty on the uh, at, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So uh, so you you learn to adjust to, like that, but. One of the things, and be serious now, um, it, it is a difficult adjustment to go from, and anyone who's been there, say, from a small or medium-sized company to a very big company, because there's a certain degree of bureaucracy in a big company that it has to be. One of the most difficult challenges, I think, in any company is what to centralize and what to decentralize. And uh, I, I don't know how many battles we've had on that. You know, if you centralize, you're supposed to get efficiency, by, but it gets to be one size fits all. But if, and if you've got a business that one size doesn't fit all, it, it makes it really tough for, for people trying to do, do that business. So uh, uh, the real challenge is to decide what you can do centralized for efficiency, and, but what you have to have the personal relationships and the interaction with the customers and the personal knowledge of that segment of the business to decentralize. And, and it's a real challenge, I'll tell you. A lot of fights. <laughs> yeah. We're over here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Ricker, for speaking with us. Um, I'm a second year MBA student. Uh, I, I had a question that can probably be answered in a lot of different ways. And some of the other questions in your own comments have touched on this industry consolidation and even in your recommendation around the uh, cable industry and how it, or the telecom companies could be looking at expanding into, you know, healthcare space and this kind of thing. And just in light of kind of the uh, too big to fail issues <laughs> that we've seen and just this ongoing consolidation and this more globalized world that we're living in, uh, how do you kind of, I wouldn't, I, I won't even box you into a particular question, but I'd just love to hear some of your comments on kind of balancing the pros and cons when I think of just, you know, a kind of monolithic monopoly situation, it kind of seems a little scary with one repository and when you just take into consideration, you know, cyber warfare and all of the personal information being stored and all of these infrastructure being centralized in one place. I don't know any of your comments around that stuff would be really interesting. Well, that, that's a challenging question with several different parts to it. And one of, one of the things, for instance, in the cable industry, it was initially, you know, thousands of mom and pop operations. And then they eventually got bought up by the big guys, uh, like uh, TCI and uh, Time Warner and Comcast and Cox and so forth. And then the big guys are buying each other up right now. And, and you know, uh, I think Comcast is trying to buy uh, Time Warner and and so, uh, and then you had the the Bell system where 
it, it was split up, you know, to all all the baby bells, and then they've done it all back together, and so you just got Verizon and AT and T now. Uh, so, um, I think the the two things I think about is even with it uh, getting to Verizon and AT and T, and uh, the markets they're going after now, they have to compete with Comcast and Time Warner and Cox and Cablevision and so forth, Charter. Uh, so because their market is, you can't have a stagnant market. You've got to go to try to find new markets to grow your business. You'll get to a point like Microsoft where you plateau out and you just make tons and tons of cash, but you can't find anything new to, to, to grow with. So. So you, you try to go to new markets with, with the big guys. So I, th I think that's one thing. Even when you, you do that, the, the big guys have to try to find new markets, and it's still you've got the competition. I think the second thing is you've got to find a way to do something innovative as far as the cost of, of doing something. If you can give somebody a service at a better cost, uh, then, then that's... People will pay for convenience, and they'll pay for for low cost. And so you you have to you have to look at that. How, how do you get the cost out? And and then obviously the third thing is you've got to look for innovation. What's something entirely new? And we've been fortunate to have people who, primarily in the software side, have have found new things. I wish we could find some new things in the hardware side too. Yep. <coughs> As someone that's about to uh, enter the workplace and graduate from Georgia Tech, what advice would you give on if you end up having a, I guess, considered a bad boss, someone that doesn't try to train people under them or doesn't really want to be a mentor to you, how do you make the best of that situation? Well, unfortunately, I, I think the only solution is you've, you've got to go somewhere and get a different boss. You, you have to go get a different job or you have to take a different course or, or something because... Uh, I think once there's, if you, I don't think you can expect people to change their ways if they've been doing it for some time. And if, if they, if the person you're working for is, doesn't have the leadership skills and is not giving you the opportunity for you to grow, is not showing you this kind of leadership that you want to emulate, then my, my opinion is that in every case I've been that way, I would uh, go and find a new boss. No, I wouldn't leave the job till I got the new one. I, I got Jack Kelly to give me to be the VP of R&D at San Diego Atlanta before I left the other one. And, uh, I get to ask you uh, to comment on two things uh, as the last questioner. The first one is um, to have you qu uh, comment about what you think about venture financing versus other ways of financing a uh, venture. We have lots of students who want to be technology entrepreneurs. Uh, they want to commercialize their investments, uh, their, um, their in inventions, yet, um, and it takes a lot of money, and they all start out thinking about exit. And I don't know how much that's driven by venture funding versus really wanting to build a business. So can you talk about uh, the time at Scientific Atlanta the, and what you would advise these young potential entrepreneurs about financing? Well, we'll probably get Charlie Mosley to come <laughs> and, and tell us the answer to this. Um, I, interestingly enough, Terry, what, uh, when I was uh, giving a lecture in Blake Charrington's course for a number of years, I'd always ask the students, what do they want to be and what do they want their job and what when they graduate from tech or when they get out of tech. Uh, and none of them wanted to go to work for a big company. All of them either wanted to be consultants or start their own company. And I think that's great. Uh, I think uh, though we've got to have people who will work with other companies and, and work up the, the ladder there. And we've had some great examples of how people have done that at Georgia Tech. But uh, I, I think that uh, you probably are going to have to find an angel to begin with. Uh, and then uh, when you've got a, a, a product and maybe a, a very good uh, sustainable business model, then maybe you can go to Nora Mosley and, uh, and get uh, some VC money. Uh, but uh, usually, and 
Don Chapman can comment on that for me. Stephen can. Uh, but the, 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 the way I've, I've seen it is that people usually start with finding someone that they can get a little start with and, and maybe even go to the incubator here with ATDC. And then uh, if they can come up with a sustainable business plan that they can sell to a, a, a Nora Mosley, then, then they can get uh, venture capital money. I think we've grown some in this area, obviously, with all the things that tech has been behind to, uh, to, to uh, stimulate uh, you know, startups. And uh, a lot of my former colleagues and friends uh, and people that work for me at Scientific Atlanta, Steve Chaddock and Jim Strategus, John Bacon, all were at Scientific Atlanta. And so they've all gone out into uh, and done very well. Comment, uh, I'd By the way, when uh, just another side comment, when uh, Charlie was at Robinson Humphrey, he did our, our $100 million IPO with, uh, at Scientific Atlanta. So uh, go way back with Charlie. <laughs> you were recognized uh, by the state legislature for your uh, career and your corporate entrepreneurship and the value that you've created in uh, Georgia and beyond. However, in the write-up about you, they also commented about the social value that you've created beyond the technological innovations that you've been involved with. What was your motivation to do those uh, well, things, and what do you advise our students? Well, you, you, you lead me in, into my sixth career that I'm in right now. So in the sixth career, I was very fortunate to be able to uh, accumulate some assets, and it has really two features. One is uh, giving back to places like the Marcus Autism Center, to the Orange Duffel Bag Foundation, Action Ministries, and to Georgia Tech. And the other is to uh, working with my children, like Mike, in uh, some family businesses, a UPS store and uh, some commercial real estate. So uh, I, I think the, the real important a thing is that if you are successful in business, then in your sixth career, I think you have an obligation to find ways to give back, and you'll find it much more rewarding than anything you've ever imagined. Thank you very no. much. Thank you.